is Ahmed, but most people know me as Baloo. I'm on a journey to discover cities around the world, their scenes, and the secret sauce behind every one of those scenes. Tonight, I'm in Amsterdam, the birthplace of EDM, the stadium DJ, and over 500 music festivals a year. This whole ecosystem that started here in the 90s just evolved and evolved and evolved. It always goes further. It's progressive, new sounds, new techniques. On the top of the list, uh, DJs, they all come from the Netherlands. I think it's in our DNA. I heard they uh, asked the people from school a question like, well, what do you want to be in the future? And like 200,000 people say, I want to be a DJ, you know? There's people who want to get rid of stuff and let go of everyday life. And there's people that come to the dance floor to get inspiration and find new information and uh, motivation to continue whatever they're doing. Unify your scene. Because when you're unified, you can speak in one voice towards the politicians and make sure, make sure that they, they listen and that you actually can get something done. What most people don't know about this Dutch city is that politics play a huge role in the dance music scene. And I found myself right in the middle of it on my trip. I'm not sure where we are, but this is a party meets protest. I have never seen a protest this fun or peaceful. We are witnessing a music protest, <laughs> which is, uh, it just speaks to, you know, how passionate people are here about music. And in this specific uh, instance, it's about the purity of music and the anti-commercialization of music, which is just great. It's happening in parallel with ADE. It's almost like one, a one package type of show. We uh, are the subcultures of Amsterdam and we use this as an occasion to do a protest. We are all dancing, but we are also dancing for a reason. That's also the name of the protest. We are very political, uh, so yeah, I do think it can be a, a vehicle for change. Every year, ADE, also known as the Amsterdam Dance Event, brings people together to raise awareness about dance culture issues that matter in this unlikely marriage of music and politics. Today, the focus is on the affordability of housing for artists and creatives in the city. Brave culture really started in squats and so on. Claimed spaces uh, in warehouses where electronic music was being played, where people came, like illegal raves and such. People think they know Amsterdam. It's notorious for being a chaotic, fun city. But look around. I don't see or feel any chaos. I see people who are so good at what they love that they invite the rest of the world to come and join them. Hi. Hello. How are you? Very well. How can I help you Uh Can I just get a, a black coffee? I wish all protests looked like this. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. You know, it transcends uh, nightlife. You know, it's beyond nightlife. It's about joy, you know? Thank you. I think that Amsterdam, or in the Netherlands in general, uh, they have such a strong dance music infrastructure. It's taken very seriously to the point where I feel like it's, it's kind of become a conversation that, you know, is, is quite political. Uh, and not political in, in, you know, in the scary or, or ugly sense. It's, it's political in the, in the sense that it's, it's built for music to thrive, and that is beautiful. 25 years ago, only 300 people came to the first ADE. It's now one of the most important dance conferences on the planet, attracting 400,000 people to a thousand different dance events across the city. To make events like ADE possible, the Dutch created the role of nightlife mayor, an elected politician of the night who represents the scene, its players, and us, the audience. When you look at Amsterdam, it's like what I think really stands out is that Amsterdam decided we need to govern the night. So when you look at the role of the night mayor, 
um, it's, it's really uh, to bridge the gap between the government, city governments, uh, city residents, but also nightlife operators. Yeah. And by bridging that gap, you create better mutual understanding, and that's how you can better govern the night and also create something like AD, which we're having now. I'm a club promoter. I'm, I've promoted parties all of my working life, you know, for the last 20 years. And uh, for me, it really was a possibility to develop my talents as a creative entrepreneur by organizing parties. Running a nightclub can be like, or a party can be like a business school for young creative kids. The city benefits from having a vibrant nightlife from social, cultural, and economic perspective. How do you see this merge of uh, nightlife and, and politics actually playing out? Yeah, so it's really, uh, you know, really often when people think about policies, they think about something which is restrictive. Right. You know, but there is also a possibility to, to change it, to change the perspective. And by having uh, smart rules and regulations, we managed to bring down the um, reports of nuisance yeah. and all these other things that are connected to the night by 40% in this district. Wow. And that is that is impact. That is and a, that's impact that for the residents. It's always a conversation, right? Yeah. It's always a conversation. That's also dance, music and yeah. politics. It's yeah. a trade-off. Right. In effect, like your your uh, dance music interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> the conversation in City Hall, those are uh, di often also difficult conversations, Absolutely. but it's very important to get all the stakeholders together. And they're all at the table when decisions are being made for your music and, and, and nightlife and your cultural scene in, in general. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of wins, right? Yeah. Creating this merge and this symbiosis between music and politics uh, yeah. generates and creates a lot of value. Connecting dance to politics takes a lot of energy and a lot of energy from everyone. Being unified, with a, speaking with a unified voice and trying to push forward your city and be proud of your city as well. Well, I'm proud of Amsterdam. <laughs> Thank you for coming, yeah. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was amazing. Okay. Thank you. Good stuff. So, off into the night. Off into the night. Yeah. Let's go out. <laughs> Mirik worked hard in his role to foster a safe and inclusive environment for everyone. But he's not the first. DJ Isis was nightmare before him, and they collaborated on pushing through 24-hour licenses for venues in Amsterdam. DJ Isis has invited me up to the northern quarter of Amsterdam to see her eclectic ADE event at Sexyland Nightclub. How does a DJ become a nighttime mayor? I have a background in politics. Actually, I was in the youth parliament when I was uh, 20 years old, and my mom was a, a real mayor <laughs> oh, wow. for nearly 30 years. So wow. I was raised like that in a way. But I, I really do care about uh, life in general, not just on the dance floor, also outside the dance floor. Do you think the nightlife scene in, uh, in Amsterdam has flourished because of this relationship between politics and dance music? No, I do not think so. Actually, I think that uh, we still are learning a lot here in Amsterdam and the Netherlands from a lot of our international colleagues that are taking that to a much higher level. Festivals like Boom Festival in Portugal or Fusion in Germany. You know, festivals that bring something else on the program but music, like content, philosophy, debates, documentaries, that kind of stuff. That's cool. That's really, like, inspiring. I've noticed here that everyone really gets this. Uh, they, get, they get the music, they get the scene, and, you know, they support it whatever way they can and everyone has something to say about it. They were raised with electronic music or dance music, it's been like part of their life. What I think is really unique about modern dance culture is that we broken down the barriers for people to dance together. Basically you want to inspire each other and uh, that's what I think uh, the dance music is about and if you look at gender or uh, 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 cultural, ethnic background, that doesn't matter on the dance no, floor, we are all one. Right. There's a lot to learn from Amsterdam. Mm. And although, uh, you know, maybe there are great benchmarks around the world, Amsterdam is one of the great ones, for sure. And it's great to, to meet someone who's behind it. No, that's so sweet. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for being with us. She's 
quite humble for who she is, and that resonates with me. The passion just, like, physically oozes out of her, you know? Like, just, just watching her think, you know? Whatever I asked her, I did not expect whatever she was going to say, you know? It's really fascinating to see music bringing so much passion into people. To understand how and when music and politics came together, I'm meeting Arne, a world-famous Dutch music journalist who's working on something pioneering. We're meeting at Our House, a club that's about to be converted into the world's first dance music museum by day and club by night. What, what do we call this? Is it a, is it a museum? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, we call it a modern museum. Yeah. You will learn what electronic music is, when it started and um, how it became uh, this way and why. We call it like a VR experience without the glasses, so you are actually in it. And then um, at 10 o'clock uh, the museum closes and uh, within one hour um, the, the venue is ready for clubbing again. I just want to understand like um, how did Amsterdam and dance music get so politicized? Well I think in like cultural subjects the, the why question is, is hard. The how question is a little bit easier. Here in the Netherlands, we had, um, we had this guy called uh, Eddie de Klerk. He was a DJ in a club called The Roxy. And he heard of um, uh, house music in New York. Um, and he said, this is going to be the next big thing. But the city wouldn't dig it at all. So he played for an empty club for a year. And in one weekend, in the 4th of September, 88, boom, it exploded. The Roxy. Was, it was a gay-oriented um, uh, club, so they also had to exclude some people, uh, like more of the rough guys. Um, they said, okay, we're not gonna, we are not allowed in the clubs, we're gonna throw parties ourselves. So they... Uh, expanded. Yeah, yeah, they, they, and there was a whole new thing of illegal parties around uh, the city. And that is where the loudest, the hardest electronic music ever uh, made comes from the Netherlands, and that exploded here in this country. And it was also the nightmare of every parent. In the mid 90s, uh, one out of three kids uh, in the classroom called uh, him or herself a gabber, which is a slang for a hardcore fan. In that period, we uh, developed a whole ecosystem, a whole dancing. We learned how to throw parties, we learned how to throw them safe. Uh, we got better in uh, logistics, we got better in sound, we got better in decoration, and this whole ecosystem with, with promoters, with artists, with labels just evolved and evolved and evolved and it got bigger and it got bar, better organized. Yeah. The organization thing is very, this very, very Dutch. What is it about Amsterdam that has all these perfect building blocks in place for, for dance music to thrive? First is revolution, then people get used to it, it's a bit normal, and then it gets mainstream, and now it's a thing we're all proud of. I mean, we even got, we got education here, we got, we got schools, schools to be a DJ. Even our royal family loves, uh, loves the house music, yeah. So tell me about the unmute protest. The nightlife was silenced yeah. for one and a half years. We got a bit frustrated, we said to each other, okay, now we have to make a statement, we have to protest, we have to let our government know the restrictions are not fair anymore. And we organized um, uh, actually sort of a love parade. All of my friends were sending me uh, uh, videos of the protests like from their windows, my, my friends that live in Amsterdam. Just seeing that, I felt proud. I felt proud of this dance community. The whole COVID, uh, COVID uh, thing made clear that uh, this is something way more than just a party and just than just get into a club with your friends, get drunk and, and get out. No, yeah. this, is, this is a way of life. That's a way of this, life. Uh, this is very important for progression, for expression, um, for, uh, for, for joy, re for releasing, yeah. for relaxing. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll actually get, get out way, way stronger. Politically, you know, you guys are, are pushing. That's, uh, that's cool, that's so cool, it's inspiring. We got a little bit used to it, what hap what's happening here in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands. And uh, talking to you, I even realized how special it is, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot, you. see you later. It. Thank you. It's mind-boggling. Uh, it's, it's insane to see how dance music can bring people together to the point where they're actually organizing 
for it and uh, you know problem solving and uh, you know designing for for this to thrive seeing it organized this way is just you know, it's, uh, it's inspiring. This is a cliche, but they say music brings people together. It's true. I think I've come at the right time to see all this in action. Venues in the center of Amsterdam host all sorts of events. And less than 10 minutes out of town, the Dockyard Festival allows everyone in the city easy access to a gathering of thousands across four main festival tents. Tonight, I'm checking out one of my favorites, PIV Records, Prunk. He's been playing here all week long. I know exactly what to expect from Prunk. Uh, it's, like, it's like going to one of your favorite restaurants and, and knowing what flavors you're going to get. It's almost the same thing, but uh, the difference is that, you know, it's not the same, you know, dish, right? It's, it's a different dish every time. That's what, you know, house music is about. You never know what's going to be played from new tracks to classics, you know, there's always a surprise uh, or two or three or ten. In this one uh, instance, I'm listening to this set because uh, I just want to be reminded of what I, uh, what I should expect. This isn't my first time at ADE and it never disappoints. This year's event was going to be limited to conferences only because of the pandemic. But the people spoke. The beat must go on. The fact that they pulled it off last minute is just more proof of how seriously the nightlife industry is taken here. We need to govern the night. I mean, it sounds pretty, uh, a little scary, right? But it's actually not. It opens up uh, opportunities. I learned that it's, the, the secret is actually the dialogue that's been happening over the past 30 years. 